Welcome to Exploring Kabbalah. In this episode, you'll hear from the founder of the Corinne Kabbalah Center, where mysticism has been taught in Atlanta for 30 years. But first, Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m., a dozen or so adults gather at the In-Town Jewish Academy Adult Education Center of Chabad In-Town of Atlanta for Kabbalah and coffee and bagels and lox. Today's theme, the secrets of the lost ark. There was a rock in the Holy of Holies from the days of the early prophets, which the commentaries say refers to David and Samuel, who laid the groundwork for construction of the temple. Rabbi Ari Solish, the director, is live streaming the class on social media. Peter Morton is one of the regulars. Growing up, I, I had absolutely no knowledge of Kabbalah, so um, I was first introduced to it at a smaller tour study group, and it, it was just basically an unknown, and, and I was confused about really what, it, what Kabbalah was. So when I, when I discovered that Rabbi Solish was giving this class, I said, excellent, I'll go to a, a, an authority, an expert, and, and, and really learn it from inside out. And uh, so I've been attending this for a while, and uh, it's um, it's good because it's made, it's made me more introspective. It's, it's another dimension. It just adds another dimension, more layers, you know, as far as your your um, knowledge, your depth of understanding of Judaism. The core sacred text of the Jewish faith is the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the five books of Moses. And according to Jewish mysticism, it too is imbued with mystical qualities. The Kabbalah says that a Torah scroll, which is written with black ink on parchment, evokes an image of fire, black fire on white fire. Black fire on white fire. And if you're wondering what's black fire, I've never seen black fire. If you look at a candle, if you look at a flame, the closer you get to the source, the darker it is. And if you really look close at the source, it's a dark, maybe it's not black, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dark hue. As you get further away from it, and, and the, the temperature is less hot, so it's a little bit whiter. So Torah is black fire on white fire. Torah's words are alive. It says that the entire, you can read the Torah in different ways. There's no punctuation in Torah. You have base, you, barely any line breaks. You know, once in a while you have spaces and line breaks. You have spaces between words. but So the Kabbalists say that the entire Torah are the names of God. All the letters, and you can read them in different ways. You can read them the way they're divided into words, or you can read them as, you know, as lines of code. There are different ways to read Torah. One thing we know, though, is that Torah, the words of Torah, are alive. On a very basic level, we can say that Torah is a guide for life. You study Torah, and not only do you know what to do and how to respond to certain situations, you learn how to think, and how to think in a way that's noble and dignified, and not just think in a way that's self-serving, but in a way that's selfless, that's giving, that's higher, higher than you know, the, low, the lowliness that otherwise is around us. Torah's words are vibrant in the sense, and alive in the sense that they inform the way we live. And they're meant to be lived by and not just studied. It's not just a history, Torah is not just a history book. This is what happened once upon a time 3,000 years ago. And it's not even a book of ancient law that's, you know, irrelevant really today. We live in a different country, in a different society. We don't, uh, you know, it's uh, American society, U.S. society in, in Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever it is, doesn't abide by Jewish law. So you might think, okay, it's an interesting ancient code of law, but it's, it's not relevant. Every verse of Torah, every line of Torah, every letter of Torah is about life, and it has guidance for life. And in that way, it's, a ver it's very much a living, breathing Torah. So I always say this. If you study Torah and it doesn't speak to you, got to try again. Try again. Keep on studying until it speaks to you. Until it changes something about how you see the world or how you live your life. Because it has so much meaning in it. It's like that fire that is moving and vibrant and vital and life-giving. And the text, perhaps because of its vibrancy, is to be grappled with. A reflection of the biblical story of Jacob wrestling with, well, that's the question. Well, there are different ways to understand this mysterious um, wrestling match of Jacob and this unnamed uh, adversary. 
So we, typically we understand it to be an angel. Some say that Jacob was fighting with himself. Allah Fight Club, right? He's like fighting with himself almost, struggling that inner struggle between, you know, what, you know where I need to be and where I am, my destiny and my, my status quo. So, you know, he, different ways to understand the struggle, but one thing is, is, is for certain, and that is that there's always anything that's worth having is the product of struggle and challenge. Anything that's worth having is uh, usually worth fighting for and the product of fighting for it. So Jacob wrestling with the angel can mean wrestling with the forces around us to try to hold us back, wrestling within ourselves to bring out the best within ourselves and not succumb to those self-defeating voices, whether it's you know, sadness or melancholy or um, uh, um, cynicism or self-doubt, whatever it is, it's not succumbing to those voices, it's, it's, it's fighting to keep on going, or it's grappling with, with, with Scripture itself. And it's, 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 unco it's, it's saying, I don't accept what the words are saying on the surface. I don't accept that this is just an, just an ancient story of Abraham and Sarah in a tent in the desert. I believe that this is a message for me. It's Torah Chaim. It's a Torah of life. And I believe that there's a life lesson that, I'm gonna, um, that I will learn from this if I just rip off the cover, so to speak. If I just uncover the truth, I can see what lies inside. Kabbalah does a lot of that. Kabbalah says that every verse, every word in Torah is a lesson in life. It's a holy, uh, you know, ho Scripture is holy. Um, the Torah is holy. But more than just abstractly being the Word of God, it's the Word of the living God for us to live by. And it, it has incredible messages in life. And Kabbalah, again, does a lot of that, explaining the rituals, explaining stories in a very contemporary way. It makes a lot of sense that Kabbalah would be embraced in the 21st century and well beyond the Jewish community. Kabbalah is the most profound wisdom about the universe and about ourselves. So it's not surprising that people searching for meaning will be attracted to this. Now, why Hollywood? I don't know. I mean, I could speculate that perhaps in a, in a, in a, in a place of heavy materialism, the, the soul cries out for something a little bit deeper. And there's nothing deeper than Kabbalah, so it, it makes sense that, uh, that Kabbalah is popular there amongst those circles. Is it blasphemy? So here's the thing. At, assuming that authentic Kabbalah is being taught, so then it's authentic Kabbalah. I think the challenge lies into how do you strip Kabbalah from Judaism? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, personally familiar with you know, what other, the teachings that are taught in, in, in other centers or whatever. I, I don't know. Um, you know, here we teach from the original text. We don't, we don't create our own text. Uh, typically, we just, uh, my, my, I, I feel like my, my role here is to be a conduit, is to tell you what it says in the books. You know, this is what it says, this is the way I understand it, and now, now you can apply it and, 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 and grow with it. Um, you know, if, if, if Kabbalah is being taught in a way that it's kind of uh, diluting the original to make it, you know, kind of pop culture or make it, that, then, then, then that might be a, a criticism against that, that methodology. But I don't have firsthand knowledge of, of how it's done or whatever it is. But again, I, I, I think that the, the popularity of, of, of Kabbalah is very understandable because it's so amazing, because it's so, it's so uplifting, it's so enriching, it's so clarifying, it's so mind-opening. It makes sense that, that people are attracted to it. And the language of mysticism in Kabbalah, the Jewish tradition, may also be reflected in mystical traditions of other spiritual paths. If something is true, you're going to find it in multiple places. In other words, if something is essentially true, it's going to come up. It's like almost like scientific uh, proof, right? If you, if you test something under multiple conditions and it still is true, then you know, then you know that's, uh, that, that, that's most likely to be a, a true reality or a true phenomenon. So the same thing is true to a large extent with, uh, with mystical teachings. You will find similar mystical traditions in other circles, in other um, societies, in other, you know, in other religious contexts, because if it's true, it's gonna be in multiple places. That's the reality of it. Now, there's, I think there's a lot of um, commonality in the Eastern traditions as well. 
so Buddhism and other, other traditions, one, one teaching that I've heard um, is that, the, and the Bible does say this, it says that Abraham, you know, toward the end of his life, he had additional children, and he sent them off to the east, and he gave them gifts. And the commentators say, what gifts did he give them? What he gave them money? He gave them, uh, you know, Hanukkah gelt. Like, what did he, like, what did he give them? So it says that he gave them gifts of wisdom. And so some have said that what does it mean that that this that the Eastern philosophies and 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 you know uh, methodologies that wisdom ultimately stems from Abraham and Abraham, of course, according to many, is the author of Sefer Yitzira, the Book of Formation. So there's a lot of Kabbalistic commonality that exists. Now that's not to say that all spiritual teach all spiritual traditions are synonymous. They're not, but you will find crossover and points that are you kind of come up in, within different traditions um, just because of the nature of either the origins or the fact that if something is true, it's, it's going to come up in multiple places. Among those places, this nondescript office building in northeast Atlanta, which houses the Corinne Kabbalah Center, is a place where the study of mysticism has been underway for three decades. Shirley Chambers is the founder and co-director. And much of my work was not just giving information. It was helping people assimilate that information to apply it in their lives. My theory is that something doesn't enhance your life experience, trash it. Because Kabbalah teaches us that we have a living God, so what is life? But that essence expresses through us. The center's primary study course is called Kabbalah, a process of awakening. People are becoming more interested in something that allows them to be. You can read Grey's Anatomy and memorize it. You can read all the medical books in the world. That gives you a lot of information and makes you very knowledgeable. But it doesn't qualify you to be a physician. So to me, you had to become a Kabbalist. You had to become the mystic, which means not only the information, not only the past history, but to be able to become and express what that information really means. And that's where I began to write uh, Kabbalah process of awakening. It is a process, and it's awakening to who you are. I use the analogy, we all know the taste of an orange. Can you explain it? But we, it's essential to know the taste of the orange in order to apply oranges to recipes. Now, substitute the taste, you might say of yourself, who you really are. If we had that taste and applied it in recipes that were appropriate for that, and not into what society believes we need to be or what we've ever up to think we need to be, we'd probably find a little more harmony, in fact, a great deal more harmony, in the lives that we're living, rather than trying to live a life that really doesn't fit the taste of what we really are. So I always explain to my classes in the beginning, this is what a physical mystic is like, the taste of the orange or the onion, whatever you choose. Now substitute yourself we would bring into existence that which is appropriate for our lives, but because we identify basically with what we're told we are, our belief systems, and there's a fear that, that if we don't believe that, then we're nothing, it's very difficult, very difficult to live your life in according with that inner expression, if you want to call it that. So this is what the, the course was geared to. It, it synthesizes when people ask me or ask the students, what are you studying? They say Kabbalah. They go, what's that? Usually the students will go, uh, because it's really a synthesis of theology, philosophy, psychology, science in a workable aspect. It works. She's a believer or advocate of Carl Jung the psychoanalyst whose writings reflect Kabbalistic understandings, as well as the symbolism of the tree of life, using archetypes or images and patterns hidden from conscious understanding. I believe in meditation. I believe that we have the power to be observant of our own lives and acknowledge we're not absolutely perfect. In fact, the lessons are for our benefit. When you attend elementary school and you have to learn arithmetic, it doesn't make you a bad person because you didn't learn arithmetic. I think we view the world in a very negative way. We look at what's wrong. And if we look at what's wrong, we're going to create what's wrong. Yes, there's things that are not conducive to harmonious living. 
but that's telling us what's not conducive. <laughs> All we have to do is, like the arithmetic, begin to adapt and, and integrate, develop within ourselves, that which seems to be missing. So that what led on this journey. And it's been a long journey. It's been probably over 35 years now of working with the tree of life, which to me is one of the most important aspects of the Kabbalistic teachings, and becoming it. We are the tree. It's not outside of ourselves. It's within us. Deciphering the Kabbalistic tree of life, the attributes of God, reveals the inner workings of the human soul. If you go into a physician's office and you see a poster there, and you see all the skins off the poster, and you see the organs and the nerves and the muscles, you don't look like that, but that's what's inside the skin. Okay? There's a part of ourselves called consciousness or soul, whichever you choose to call, that also has an inside, that also has aspects of expression, where what we see in the doctor's office, as, uh, doctor's office are aspects of existence. The tree of life is those aspects. When we begin to develop those through recognition, through meditation, through understanding what they represent, we become the tree. And the tree is the oldest glyph. We cannot trace its origins. It's the first thing mentioned in the Bible and the last thing mentioned in the Bible. It's, it's very important to Genesis, and it ends in Revelation, in both the Bible containing both the Old and New Testaments. So, and also in almost every mythology of the world, there's a tree. Osiris was placed into a tree in Egyptian mythology. So what does all that mean? It means it's something that we are, not something that we use. It's something we become, but how do we become it? We don't know. We have no idea. We can understand on a conscious level, but we have to understand it on an unconscious level also. And that's what the process of awakening does. You awaken to who you are. The tree really goes downward into existence, meaning if it's a root of something, it's come from something greater. If you look at a bush and you see the roots, you know, they, did, they had to come from somewhere else. So I think there's much more to our universe and much more to who we are than we've really accepted about ourselves. I think we've disempowered ourselves by thinking that the results are conducive or based upon accomplishment and success. You can say accomplishment and success, but is it external or is it internal? And what's internal will manifest in the external. It's like I say, if you view the world in a negative sense, we're going to create a world based upon that viewpoint. Because according to the Kabbalistic tradition, we are creators. We all hear the statement, we are co-creators with God, and yet very few understand what that really means. Anne says Chambers, those mystical understandings may not have completely emerged within Judaism, but flowed into it. If you've ever studied the Vedanta or the Vedic teachings, which they really can't locate authors, they predate, they're about 10,000, over 10,000 years old. Uh, they flowed into an understanding which a group of people identified as the culture of Jews were able to accept. They were, they were very intelligent. They, they were the, the college people of their time. So they were able to take it and apply it on a level relative to their time frame, which was, you know, we, we date Abraham to about 1900 BC. It's interesting because his name was Abram, the word coming perhaps from the Vedic teachings of Brahman, which means expansion, and his name means expansion flowed into. So to me, that was a cycle. We live in massive family waves on this planet that have existed for eons of time. We know through science, we are discovering buried thousands and thousands of feet underground. We're discovering artifacts that seem to surpass where we are now in some of the technology. So where did it come from? Why did it seem to disappear? So we're discovering a repetition, just like in life. You're a year older every year, but you go through January through December. Every year you go through a cycle. Life exists on all levels the same way. As above, so below is the axiom. It's so interesting. So if you study the below, you can have some idea what the above might be like, but not in its actuality. So as I said, where did the tree, where did the glyph of the tree come from? 
you know, uh, what we call uh, Solomon's seal or the Star of David. I've been to Tibet. There's stars of David all over the place up there, predate Judaism by thousands of years. Pictured on ancient walls. So there had to be a beautiful flow of understanding into this life wave that there had to be a certain age reached to accept that understanding. Every life wave begins in a childhood. You don't take a child. I use the example, for instance, of, of, of parents who are attorneys and they have children. They save their textbooks because the children, possibly one or two, will grow up to be an attorney. While those textbooks are very valid now, there will be changes made. Because when they achieve that level to become attorneys, things will have changed. So they can't follow exactly the old textbooks. They have to modify those to fit the new. When I look back in time, and I've done extensive research, I was born and raised Catholic and was very disgruntled with Catholicism and one of the ones who questioned and told that I didn't have faith if I questioned. So when I left Catholicism, I studied all the religions in the world, so all the isms. And I realized they were saying the same thing in essence. They just applied differently to different stages of growth and different consciousnesses, different cultures were all unique. So it was saying essentially, look at the essence, not at the structure. And that's why I feel all structures are good because we're drawn to structures that we're magnetically compatible with, that we resonate to when, as we come into life. But for the most part, many of the structures haven't expanded, like the law books, to suit each new life wave coming in. Not making them wrong, but saying there needs to be a greater understanding of what's contained in these are no longer suitable for a younger age of consciousness. So that, like I say, the tree of life, because it's an archetype, you know, and Carl Jung did a lot of work with archetypes because it, it is the language of consciousness. It is the language of the unconscious. And it's very powerful. We all know, you don't even have to see McDonald's and see the sign McDonald's anymore when you see the golden arches. You know, it's McDonald's, okay? Take that same idea or the Nike reverse check mark. You know it's Nike. You don't have to see the name. Now take that same idea and look at something that's brought into this life wave. We had an ice age that ended 75,000 years ago, actually finished about 12,500 years ago. Much was obliterated. So how did all this get back? I look at the Vedic teachings and I see a synthesis in Judaism in the basic teachings of what Vedanta. And those textbooks have no authors. Where did they come from? How did they get here? How was it carried forward? It was brought into Judaism about 1900 BC with the advent of Abraham, who, as I said, names probably came from a Brahmin, which means expansion, and to say it's time to get a, a better look at yourself, time to see yourself as more than what you are now. Uh, yet those existed 10,000 years ago. They could have been dated. The Mazdean scriptures... Uh, which predate Genesis, have the same story as Genesis. The names are changed. Meshoya and Meshoya lived in a garden, disobeyed God, got kicked out. Same story. And it predates our Old Testament by a few thousand years. To me, it validates it. It takes nothing away. But it validates this continuity of understanding as it flowed. And, of course, as it flowed into uh, Merkaba mysticism was probably the first aspect of what we call Kabbalah. And it was based on the wheels of Ezekiel. According to Jewish mystical teachings, the prophet Ezekiel, who lived in the 6th century before the Common Era, during the Israelites' Babylonian exile, is said to have seen a vision of God on a chariot with four angelic creatures and four wheels, illustrating God's nature and power demonstrating that God remains active in the world even in difficult times, just as human actions impact the divine realm. Kabbalah teaches a living God, not one who sits somewhere else and places judgment. How does God live? If God's a life in everything, then obviously spirit works through us. God, spirit, the universe. Again, we try to transcend labels because we get trapped in labels. So I try to interchange God, the universe, spirit, what you refer to. I tell people in class, you identify it in your way. Don't use mine. It's your way. We're individuals. We're not all dancing to the same tune. 
I can only provide a certain way for you to find your own music. And when you do, then you're free to dance that music according to what you hear. Uh, we create this very existence every moment. You know, and Kabbalah teaches if the thought and the mind of God cease to exist, the universe would cease to exist. If we're created image and likeness of God, then that does not apply to us. We constantly, without knowing it, are holding this creation in existence. Okay? So, therefore, if we're holding it in existence, we are creating it into existence. People come and say, what's Kabbalah do for me? i got nothing. It's a tool. It's like a chainsaw. It's sitting there. What you do with that, you make yourself. We provide a way that helps you understand yourself through conscious understanding. We apply unconscious work, which is the archetypes. And we begin to help you achieve that union with your own soul. There's the tying back again to what you really are so it can grow. Even death is a con it's, it's like... It's continuation. It I think we're one totality. I think we're just like you're a totality your body. You've got feet and hands. They don't look the same, but they're all you. All right, take that into the world. You've got Judaism. You've got Hinduism. They're just parts of one big body. But they're still all the one body. The unfortunate part is the parts are not agreeing with each other. <laughs> the parts are not compatible. Recognizing each other is valid. That's the point. Not disagreeing, but recognizing the validity of those parts that they need to work together. They need to help each other. There's a flow within you that's undisturbed by what happens in the world, giving you free to act in the world. Simple word, find yourself. Find an inner journey. Have less dependency on the world around you and know there's a part of you that has created the world around you and it can change it. That's probably the best thing. When you reach that place within yourself called the promised land, we haven't found it yet. What's it promised? That we'll create a world of beauty and harmony. But you have to reach the land. We're still crossing the desert. We still haven't crossed that desert yet.